diabetes insipidus. So I'm going to start off just introducing the concept, then we'll talk about the physiology, the normal regulation of thirst and water, uh, and then we'll talk a little bit about treatment, and that will take us on nicely, hopefully, to the other two talks. So this is what it's all about, okay? Hopefully this will work. Uh, I don't know if you remember this Carlsberg advert. It was taken from um, a film called Ice Cold in Alex, but you would have all been craving for a beer or a Diet Coke. This man's been through the hell of war and he's desperate for a beer. You must have all had it. This is what's happening with the thirst regulation. So I should probably declare at this stage that I have no vested interest in Carlsberg, whatever, when I do these talks. But you'll all appreciate how bad it is to be terribly thirsty and not have access to a drink. Now the reason that humans and other animals, because this process is a very conserved thing in evolution for millions of years, the reason we get thirsty is it's a life-saving mechanism. And the hypothalamus, which is a very primitive organ in all species, is a hugely important part of the brain. Not only controls thirst, it controls appetite, sleep, mood, temperature regulation, breathing, uh, when it talks to the midbrain, uh, pain sensation. So um, the hypothalamus is a central structure in the brain that, as you all know, as endocrine specialist nurses, is the con controls the pituitary. But this is the neurological control, the fast control of the posterior pituitary rather than the slower control of the anterior pituitary. And what happens is when you're dehydrated, like our man ice cold in Alex, who's desperate for his beer, uh, the hypothalamus senses that you're dehydrated and therefore realizes that it badly needs water. And it senses that through the receptors in the nucleus of the hypothalamus, happens to be called the supraoptic nucleus. Uh, and those receptors are called osmoreceptors because they're detecting the concentration. And so osmoreceptors detect how concentrated the blood is in order to uh, stabilise things through homeostasis. It's a beautifully controlled uh, system in health. Um, and osmoreceptors are stimulated, they kick into action when osmolality is high. Osmolality is not something to get confused or worried by. Osmolality simply means the concentration of fluid. Uh, whether it's blood or urine. Okay? Uh, so for example, here's a concentrated urine, dark yellow wee, uh, and that's urine of a high osmolality, so it's concentrated and it's dark yellow. It simply talks about the number of osmoles within, within a diluent. Whereas this is urine of low osmolality, it looks indistinguishable from water, in fact it is water, and it's dilute and pale, so high osmolality, low osmolality okay so it's just uh, replace it for concentration so when the concentration or osmolality of blood is high as we've said the osmoreceptors get stimulated this leads to two things the first thing is a behavioral adapted adaptive life-saving response of extreme thirst and the drive to drink because the body knows uh, that it needs water otherwise the brain will shrink into a walnut and the second life-saving mechanism, which is the endocrine, the neuroendocrine response, is the release of ADH or vasopressin. Okay. Uh, ADH means antidiuretic hormone. People often use um, the terms interchangeably, vasopressin, ADH. I think I prefer vasopressin these days. It does what it says on the tin in terms of ADH. It stops you peeing. It's antidiuretic. Okay. So it does the opposite of a diuretic. It makes you conserve water, just water, stops you peeing water. And the way it does that, essentially, if you think about passing urine like a sink, if you want to fill up the sink, which is your body, with water, you can either uh, turn the tap on and drink, or you can put the plug in to stop the water coming out. And that's exactly what vasopressin does. So. Um, the behaviour response is to turn the tap on and drink, but vasopressin stops water leaking out of the kidney and conserves water into the system. So here's ice cold in Alex, desperate for his beer, so he's got two responses. One is thirst, 
uh, because he's stimulating his osmoreceptors. But the other thing that's happening is you get this neurological release of vasopressin, which works on the kidney to reabsorb water. You hang on to water, so water's held on by the kidney. And as you know, that will lead to reduced urine output and therefore uh, restores fluid volume in the circulation. And that's why your pee goes dark yellow when you're very thirsty, because you're conserving water. Now, there is a molecular mechanism for this that I've nicked a slide from Steve Ball. Uh, this is what happens. It's pretty cool. So here is the inside of the kidney uh, where water is being re reabsorbed. And this is the outside of the kidney where urine is flowing. These are the receptors. So just bear with me for the animation. So this is vasopressin. It's working on the receptor. It's causing a conformational change in the protein. And this is called the aquaporin gene. But what that does is it causes a very cool um, collection of proteins, which uh, causes aquaporin channels, which causes water to be reabsorbed. So that's the molecular mechanism of how vasopressin or ADH works. It causes a conformational change in the kidney to hold on to water. Okay, so when people are very, very dehydrated and desperate for a drink, you drink according to extreme thirst. Of course, drinking is partly behavioural. Some people, without needing it, drink more water, and that, that's a separate phenomenon. Um, but also, you stop peeing because of this response of vasopressin release. And therefore, you pass increasingly concentrated urine. And this is a life-saving response to replace yourself with fluid and to reabsorb water through vasopressin. If, for whatever reason, you don't produce vasopressin, which our patients with pituitary disease uh, have that problem, then what happens is you don't have the plug. And so, therefore, water continues to leak out even when the body needs to hold on to it. So you could be in the Sahara Desert, you could be ice cold Alex, who wouldn't have peed for a while through his trip to the pub. But he would, if he had diabetes insipidus or if he didn't have vasopressin, he would not be able to reabsorb water and he'd still be peeing gallons of pale fluid even though he desperately needs to hang on to it. And this is diabetes insipidus because you are peeing insipid pale urine that looks indistinguishable from pure water. So the two hallmarks of diabetes insipidus when you've got the diagnosis, when you see a genuine case, is this constant unquenchable thirst for ice cold drinks which Pat will tell us about very eloquently and we'll hear desperately how Kane was desperate for a drink after his operation not being given it by the ward nurses. Uh, but also diabetes insipidus, as well as a constant unquenchable thirst, it's characterised by a constant need to pass very large volumes of water, both in the daytime and the nighttime, which is incredibly inconvenient. OK, so you've lost the plug because you've lost vasopressin and therefore water continues to leak out. Now, this is dangerous because if you persistently lose water through the urine, inappropriately, you're going to get dehydrated far quicker than somebody who can reabsorb water and, then sh and therefore your blood or your osmolality would become dangerously concentrated. Now, if you lose too much fluid, water will eventually, the last organ to be conserved if you're in trouble is the brain. And if you are in so much trouble, you've lost water, your brain will shrink into a walnut and that can cause an intracranial catastrophe and death if untreated. The first thing that happens is your sodium goes up because water is lost compared to sodium so you get hypernatremic. That's a sign that the body is not coping. The next sign is the brain shrinks and that will be given uh, will be characterized by cerebral irritation and severe agitation as well as extreme thirst, very irritable behavior and eventually death. Now, the tragedy of these unnecessary deaths that are occurring in the UK that we can all help out with by educating and spreading the word is that the treatment is absolutely simple. Two things, fluid replacement, either through the mouth or if patients are unwell intravenously, and vasopressin or desmopressin, which is the vasopressin analogue. 
uh, vasopressin only lasts, has a very short half-life, so desmopressin lasts uh, for a long time, so it, it works, so you don't have to take it more than twice a day. It comes in either tablets, Desmo tabs, it comes as a nasal spray, Desmo spray, it comes as a melt under the tongue, Desmo melts, or it comes in as, as an in injection intramuscularly or intravenously. Now the problem that we are faced with, and I think the thing where you can really help out as endocrine specialist nurses, as the only person that knows about diabetes insipidus in the hospital, is that no one else has heard of it, not even the pharmacists often, that's a bit disingenuous, but sometimes not, they're not infallible like the rest of us. And it's often not stocked on the wards, and this seems to be a common problem. Not only have people not heard of diabetes insipidus, but they've not heard of desmopressin. And if it's a nasal spray, people tend to um, reduce the importance of it. But of course, it's desperately important. Now, we're talking about central or cranial uh, uh, vasopressin or di diabetes insipidus. So remember, the desmopressin will only work as a treatment if you're deficient in it, not if you're resistant or if the receptors don't work. So we're talking about a problem with the pituitary. So those are our patients. We're not talking about renal patients. So this is central diabetes insipidus due to pituitary disease. So it's either called central or cranial because it's in the brain, pituitary, hypothalamus or pituitary, usually because of either a pituitary operation or infiltrative pituitary disease, such as a craniopharyngioma or lymphocytic hypophysitis. It's unusual for a normal pituitary tumour to cause diabetes insipidus uh, because it tends to respect the anatomy to the anterior pituitary unless a surgeon has gone in there or unless it's an infiltrative condition. But I'm not going to talk about the pathophysiology of the actual uh, pathology of the tumour. I want to get the, the diabetes insipidus uh, case across. So desmopressin, with the best will in the world, uh, shortened to DDAVP, will not work if there's a problem with the kidney where there's resistance, where that cool slide I showed you from the board, that the, the molecule will not work because it won't be seeing the desmopressin. And that's if patients have kidney disease or if they've got um, electrolyte disturbance, hypercalcemia causes nephrogenic diabetes insipidus. Uh, hypokalemia can cause it and lithium or other medication can cause it. So... That's called nephrogenic diabetes insipidus, and that will not respond to vasopressin. And these are patients that should be under the renal physicians rather than the endocrinologists, because we're dealing with pituitary, hypothalamic pituitary pathology. So when you're monitoring patients on desmopressin from clinic or on the wards, if the dose of desmopressin is too low, if they're not taking enough, then they haven't got enough of the plug, then they'll be still thirsty and they'll be peeing lots. Okay, So if they're unwell, they might need to increase the amount they drink and they might need to increase the desmopressin dose. This is always best done through self-management, like any condition, so we need to educate the patients. If the dose is too high, uh, they've got too much of the plug, and that's, that can be just as dangerous. If you're taking too much desmopressin and you're not allowing a diuresis, you're not allowing yourself to wee, in the day, uh, and often societies, um, patients, doctors recommend having a day off a week to make sure you definitely unload the sink, as it were, uh, then you pass less urine. And the danger of that is that you over dilute your blood, the osmolality goes low, and that can lead to a low sodium hyponatremia, and that can lead to seizures, the opposite of cerebral shrinkage. It can lead to cerebral edema, swelling, and that can be just as dangerous. Now, what's this got to do with diabetes? The answer is nothing, and that's the problem, at least not sugar diabetes, which is the thing that everybody thinks of when you use any term with the name diabetes. Why wouldn't you? Everybody's heard of diabetes, mellitus. It just so happens that diabetes is the old-fashioned Greek term for, uh, or the Greek term for an old-fashioned thing called a siphon, where water goes in and water goes out. So in sugar diabetes, water's being pulled out by the glucose, and then you're replacing it with fluid. Of course, in diabetes insipidus, it's the water loss, not uh, because of high glucose. And it's a very bad name, even in 2020. And there are moves to potentially change the name because it causes chaos and confusion. And patients with pituitary disease are getting their blood sugars checked here, there and everywhere without any assessment of fluid status. The evidence that it's a bad name comes from the fact that we've seen quite a few preventable deaths that's moved the NHS patient a uh, safety alert to give a warning a few years ago. Um, there's been a very bad experience that has been reported amongst pituitary patients, and Pat will tell us this through the Pituitary Foundation. 
There have been many publications, in fact there was one just this month in the Journal of Clinical Endocrinology to show that hypopituitary mortality is increased uh, in inpatients and it seems to be linked to diabetes insipidus. So there's also um, there's a sort of signal from abroad as well as in the UK. Um, and we did a survey through the Society for Endocrinology to all consultants and registrars, 200 people responded and 55% noticed harmful events, people coming to harm because of a lack of awareness of diabetes insipidus and desmopressin. So it appears to be a problem. So what can we all do? What can you do? Well, firstly, shout it from the rooftop, spread the word, go and educate the nurses on the wards. Okay, we'll see from Pat that it seems that it's not in the nursing curriculum and we need to change that. Uh, Pat and her colleagues, Menai uh, in the Pituitary Foundation have been brilliant. They have developed Pituitary uh, Foundation Diabetes Insipidus cards, which we may end up going the way of steroid cards for the Department of Health, but it's a bit of a pain getting everything through the red tape, but we are going through the Royal College of Physicians trying to do that. But all patients should carry a card or a safety bracelet alert, education. Um, again, the Pituitary Foundation have put up sick day rules, exactly the same as with steroids, to try and increase the awareness and increase the dose of desmopressin if people are unwell and dehydrated. So they're very, very sensible guidelines. We've written guidelines for doctors. The problem is, how do you get people to read them? There's so many guidelines to read. If you're an A&E doctor or an orthopaedic surgeon, why are you going to read guidelines for diabetes insipidus? Um, but we have written them and they're very straightforward. 